So let's uh, move on then. Uh, so the next topic I wanted to discuss was um, hyperbolic groups. and some approximation properties of hyperbolic groups and where they fit in with these uh, other properties that we've defined um, so far. And at this point, I have a little bit of a confession to make, and that is that I am not certainly by any means an expert on hyperbolic groups. In fact, uh, I've never really worked so closely with hyperbolic groups. Um, uh, and one of the reasons why I chose this topic for this course, uh, well, is because one, I have this FRG grant and, and it's related to actions on hyperbolic spaces. Uh, and then the other reason is that by forcing myself to teach this topic, I figured it would make me learn all the um, technicalities and, and subtleties that uh, you might not notice if you don't teach it. Uh, so that being said, uh, I apologize in advance if uh, I might be a little rough on some of the arguments here, um, since this is my first time, uh, you know, teaching anything about hyperbolic groups. Okay, but let me start with, we aren't going to talk about groups uh, for uh, probably a couple lectures or so, but we're just going to talk about graphs. So let's go ahead and let uh, gamma be a graph a connected graph. Is this Wojcolescu's method? Is this what he did? All right, that works. I know uh, when I was at Berkeley, there was Richard Borchards and he taught a course in von Neumann algebras one semester. And, uh, and this was specifically because he wanted to learn von Neumann algebra. So this, this is a good method. It does force you to learn things uh, by teaching on, on it. Uh, um, by giving a course on it. All right, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, so let gamma be a connected graph. Uh, so by a graph here, I just mean it's vertices and edges. This is an, a non-directed graph. Um, and, uh, and I don't want edges to be connected or don't want vertices to be connected to themselves. So no, no loops like that. Uh, no no self, self loops. Uh, so, uh, but I will put no conditions on say how many vertices, there could be infinitely many vertices uh, and each vertex could be have an edge connecting to infinitely many uh, other vertices, that's, that's fine. Um, okay, so, but if you have any connected graph, then I can view this as a metric space uh, with the path distance. So uh, we'll view this. as a metric space. Let the path distance. Uh, so that two vert the distance between two vertices is the uh, minimum number of edges that you need to connect the two vertices. Uh, so meaning that the, so a path uh, so what is a path? The path is just a sequence of vertices, say alpha n, uh, alpha k, k goes from 1 to n, uh, such that uh, alpha k of, such that alpha k, let me write it more as a function, alpha k, such that alpha k and alpha k plus one uh, is an edge in gamma for all k. All right, so that's all I mean by a path. And, uh, and if you have two vertices, then the, well, so the length of this path is just n, and if you have two vertices, the distance between them is the minimum, the length of, the, of a minimum path between them. There may be more than one minimum path, but there's at least one. Uh, they're called geodesics. So we'll say that uh, a path alpha is geodesic. 
if um, uh, the distance between alpha n and alpha m is exactly n minus m. All right, so that's a that's a geodesic. Um, I'll put a little remark in that. So this is just a discrete metric space. Uh, however, sometimes uh, it might be convenient to glue the edges in and think of it as a continuous metric space where the edges are each identified with a unit interval. So that's just a remark. At this point, this is just a discrete uh, metric space, but occasionally in some of the proofs, we might want to glue in the edges. Uh, what else? And by connected, by connected, I just mean that there's a path connecting any two vertices. Uh, so there is some, some path connecting any two vertices. And hence there's a path of minimal length and a path of minimal length will be a geodesic uh, necessarily. Uh, okay, so um, that's what I wanna say about that. Uh, I'll also use some, um, you know, let's see. So a geodesic triangle so sometimes we'll, we may write this interval x to y for a geodesic connecting uh, a vertex x to a vertex y. So I'm not assuming that there are unique geodesics uh, so this notation uh, doesn't uniquely define a geodesic from x to y, but when I use this notation, I just mean some geodesic from x to y. There may be more than one. Okay, so what is a geodesic triangle? A geodesic triangle um, uh, consists of three points, three vertices, x, y, and z, and three geodesics, one from x to y, one from y to z, and one from z to x. Uh, so, Again, there may be many different geodesics you can take, and these will all give a geodesic triangle. And now I can give you the definition of uh, what does it mean for a triangle to be thin? So here's a definition. A geodesic triangle, uh, let me give a name, delta. So this is x, y. Mm -hmm. uh, YZ union CX is delta slim. If any uh, geodesic for one side is contained in some delta neighborhood of the union of the other two sides. So if um, the delta neighborhood of any two sides contains the third side. And here's the canonical picture you have here. So here's uh, x, y, and z. And so we have some path connecting some geodesic from x to z, some geodesic from z to y, some geodesic from x to y, and we have some delta. And so if we look at the delta neighborhood of this geodesic, we get something like this. 
And if we look at the Delta neighborhood uh, of this geodesic, we get something that looks like this. So this is the Delta, uh, Delta neighborhood, uh, which the Delta neighborhood um, of any point so the delta neighborhood of any set is by definition uh, the set of all vertices x in uh, x in the graph such that there exists some a and a with the distance between x and a less than or equal to delta so that's the delta neighborhood so delta here uh, is typically some large number, but some large finite number. Okay, so that's uh, what it means for a geodesic triangle to be delta slim. Uh, the other thing that I'll need is that is gonna be useful for um, this sort of situation. So these are the triangles we like. These are the types of uh, graphs that we like that they're there are triangles like this. Uh, so the other thing I'll need is I'll need the Gromov product. So if x, y, and z are on the graph, then the Gromov product is uh, denoted by y, z, sub x, and this is defined as the distance, it's one half the distance from y to x plus the distance from z to x minus the distance from y to z. So what is this? So that's just the definition. Uh, what does this mean geometrically? Well, uh, for any For any geodesic triangle, um, uh, delta, there is a unique uh, tripod uh, called the comparison tripod. Uh, so what is that? A tripod is something that looks like this. So this is just, if you want, this is some three points in, in R squared, but it's just a union. It's, it's a graph, which is a union of, it's a tree with, with just three uh, edges like this. Uh, there exists a unique tripod, X, Y, and Z, uh, and a unique comparison map. F, so it's called a tripod T, F mapping uh, the triangle, the geodesic triangle to T. And this is, so here we have the triangle X, Y, Z. Here's our, and we have this F here. And this is such that uh, F is, um, preserves the metric for each of the edges of the triangle. Uh, so such that uh, so such that F restricted to XY and F restricted to YZ and F restricted to XZ are isometries. Uh, so again, here I'm thinking of this as maybe a continuous, uh, a continuous situation. Uh, so that's this distance. Uh, so this vertex need not be an integer distance from x. In fact, it could be a half integer distance. Uh, uh, so yeah, it doesn't take long to convince yourself that such a, there's always a unique tripod and there's always a unique comparison map 
So you just have X here and you take, uh, you just start mapping it out so that's isometric here. And indeed, how do you actually construct this or how do you verify that it exists? Uh, the lengths of this tripod are exactly given by this chroma product. And so this is where the lengths, where the lengths of each of the legs of the tripod are given by the Grimmel products. So specifically, uh, if we take this distance here, the distance here is going to be exactly um, the Grimmel product XZ sub Y. And the distance uh, here is exactly the Grimmel product XY sub Z. And the distance here is exactly the Grimmel product uh, YZ X. And if you just look at uh, how the Grimmel product is defined, you see that uh, such a tripod, so we just define a tripod with these things. And then we see that as we go along the geodesic from X to Z, we exactly get the length. So if we take this plus this, we exactly get the distance from X to Z. And so this geodesic here has a natural bijection to this geodesic here. Uh, you guys can't see what I'm writing. This geodesic here has an, is in bijective correspondence with this geodesic here, just because they have the same length. And similarly, this geodesic here has the same length as this geodesic here, so you can map one to the other. And similar, this geodesic has the same length as this geodesic, and so you can map one to another. So, and to see that they have the same lengths, you just compute this what this plus this is, and you see that it gives you the distance from X to Z. So therefore, we get this unique comparison map from any geodesic triangle uh, in any graph. There's a unique comparison map to a tripod like this. Uh, so, so the actual definition of a tripod is the original three vertices along with a new and geodesics? Uh, so, uh, so here I'm just thinking of everything as uh, say inside, so a tripod is maybe, uh, if you want this is, uh, it's four vertices in R squared in the real plane, which satisfies these distances. This is all I mean. Okay. So I'm thinking of this as some, top, uh, some metric space. So one quick question. Mm -hmm. You said that this Gromo product will give us the, the metrics on, on this tripod. How do the, the, the distance between two points in the tripod works with respect to the met to this? Uh, uh, so say that again. How, how would I measure the distance between two points in the tripod? Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The, we're taking the, the path metric in the tripod. So it's, it, we embed it into R squared, but then we take the path metric so that you go through the the vertex here. Right, so what am I doing? I'm saying here, uh, for this length, uh, we identify, we identify this edge with this geodesic, we identify this edge with this geodesic, and we identify this edge with this geodesic. Okay. Now the length for any two points here uh, if you want to think of the length, you just think of the length here plus the length here. Right, so it's still the graph, the graph length. But each of these is just uh, homey, is just uh, isometric to an interval. Right, so it's just three intervals which are glued together. So maybe forget, forget about R squared. By a tripod, I just mean three intervals that are glued together. That's a better way to say it. But the actual lengths in R2 are given by this Gromov product, right? Uh, no, no, no. Forget R2. Forget what I said in R2. Uh, okay. All I'm saying is a tripod is three intervals that are glued together. So the Gromov product tells us the length of the legs of the tripod. 
Mm, okay. So, and this is how we should think of the Gromov product geometrically, as the Gromov product gives exactly this length of this leg in the comparison tripod. Okay. All right. So that's. Um, I was thrown off because I thought that T somehow existed in the original space that held uh, the triangle. No, no, no. So the tripod, the tripod is just some abstract, uh, abstract uh, space, which is just a union of three intervals. No, no, no. So it's a unique tripod, but this has nothing to do with the original graph. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you for asking the questions. It makes forces me to clarify exactly what I mean. Uh, so we'll say here's another definition. So definition. The uh, geodesic triangle delta is delta thin if it satisfies the property that for any two points which are mapped to the same point in the tripod, they have to be at most delta apart. So if uh, for any, if whenever u and v are uh, ver points on the triangle, such that f of u is equal to f of v. So then we have that um, the distance between u and v, and this is again in the original graph, is less than or equal to delta. And so that's what it means for a geodesic triangle to be uh, delta thin. thin. Uh, so the remark here is to note that if our geodesic triangle is delta thin, then it is delta slim. So remember delta slim said that the delta neighborhood of any two sides covered the third side. Uh, so why is that the case? That's just because if we take uh, if we take any point in one side and we see where does the comparison triangle map it to, it's going to map it to either this interval or this interval. So therefore there's some point on one of these other two sides, which it's, which it's, uh, they're both mapped to, right? This comparison map is, is two to one. So for any point on this side, it's mapped to the same point as something on one of these two sides. But delta thin says that therefore it's within delta of that point. So therefore any point on this side is within del distance delta of one of the two sides. Now, does this make sense? All right, so delta thin triangles are always delta slim. Uh, so you can, uh, yeah, so on the other hand, so let me give you now a definition. So a definition uh, the group, the metric space gamma is hyperbolic. If there exists some delta greater than zero, such that every geodesic triangle is uh, delta slim, let's say. Uh, in particular, it implies every geodesic triangle is delta thin, but we'll also prove the converse so that the notion of hyperbolicity, actually you could take delta slim or delta thin, whichever you want. So that's the next remark I want to to make. So let's prove this as a theorem. Theorem, if every uh, geodesic triangle in gamma 
is delta slim. So then every geodesic triangle and gamma is four delta thin. So therefore, if you want to a hyperbolic space, you could we could have equivalently just said that there's some delta such that every geodesic triangle is delta thin. Uh, either way is fine. Uh, so let's go ahead and prove this theorem. Uh, so we have um, Yeah, so what's what's the idea? So let's suppose we have, let's suppose every geodesic triangle is delta slim. Uh, and then we want to show that every geodesic triangle is, is four delta uh, thin. So we'll suppose one thing. So we have that uh, we fix x, y, z, and gamma and geodesics. x to y, y to z, and z to x. So let's take, fix a geodesic triangle. Uh, so again, here's the picture. So we have x, y, and z. And we have this comparison tripod with this comparison map here. So x, y and z. Oh, maybe that uh, is perhaps some of the confusion is also because these these uh, are live in different spaces. So maybe I should do x prime, y prime, z prime or something like this. But I'll use the same labels so that uh, um, they correspond to the same thing. But right, this vertex x is different than this vertex x. They live in different graphs. So really I should mean maybe f of x or f of y, f of z. Um, but okay, this is the comparison triangle. Uh, and now let's take two points here, U and V, which are sent to the same point. Uh, and we'll do, uh, so fix uh, this and fix U and V uh, in, the, in the triangle uh, such that F of U is equal to F of V. And let me uh, give this triangle, let me give the vertex here a name, let me call it T. Uh, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna prove this theorem in the special case where uh, they're mapped to T. So case one, and that is that F of U is equal to F of V is equal to T. Uh, okay, so then what's the point here? Uh, so what do we know? We know that this geodesic triangle is delta slim. So since delta's, uh, since it's delta slim, we know that U is delta away from one of these two, uh, delta, this U is delta away from one of these two edges here. So since, uh, the triangle is delta slim. We have that U is in the delta neighborhood of uh, the geodesic from X to Y union the geodesics from Y to Z. Uh, but on the other hand, if, so we'll take these two cases separately. So if U is in the delta neighborhood of the geodesic from X to Y. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that, um, and this is regardless of if, it's, if this equals the triple point, uh, what this means is that, so U and V we know are sent to the same point here. And so if we have that U is in a delta neighborhood, uh, so then that means that this distance uh, the distance from that point to V has to be delta because we know that this map 
is isometric, and so it can't send it far away from itself. So if u is in a delta neighborhood of this uh, interval x to the y, then since f of u is equal to f of v, we have that the distance from u to v has to be less than two delta. Because whatever point it maps to has to be within delta of uh, v, because we know that they're mapped to the same point on this, on this comparison triangle. So this is just the triangle inequality in play here. All right, and then similarly, we know that V is in the union of delta neighborhoods of XZ and ZY. So similarly, if V is in a delta neighborhood of the geodesic from X to Z, so then the distance from U to V is less than two delta. So in these cases, uh, we're fine. Otherwise, if U is in a delta neighborhood of uh, YZ and V is in a delta neighborhood of uh, YZ, right? So that's the other case we have to consider. Well, in this case, since I'm assuming that we're in case one, where they're mapped to T and T is mapped, we can take some other W here, which is mapped to T. So take W in this geodesic Z to Y, such that F of W is equal to T. So remember here, I'm thinking of these as continuous, so I'm gluing in the, the edges here. So this W may live halfway between two vertices, but that's okay. Uh, so we take some w in this geodesic such that f of w is t. Well then for the same reason because they're all mapped to t, we have that therefore the distance from u to w is less than 2 delta and the distance from v to w is also less than 2 delta. So therefore the distance from u to v is less than 4 delta. All right, but this was under case one where we assumed that they went to the same triple point. Uh, so we assumed that they went to the triple point. So now we have case the, the general case. So in the general case, uh, we'll go ahead and assume that they map to some point on the length on the edge from X to, to T. Um, so let's go ahead and assume, so in the general case, uh, we'll assume that f of u uh, is equal to f of uh, v, and this uh, is on the interval from x to t. Uh, well, we actually, sorry, we know that. We don't need to assume it since. So U, we're taking U on the, oh, this is what I wanted to assume is that we can take, so assume that U is in the geodesic from X to Z, like I drew in the picture, and V is in the geodesic from X to Y. So by symmetry, we can just assume U is in this geodesic and, and V is in the other geodesic. Right? So then, then we know that since they're mapped to the same point, that map has to be somewhere between X and T. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to uh, shrink the length of Y. So we're just gonna choose a Y prime somewhere along the geodesic from X to Y and then we're just gonna choose some geodesic to Z. And when we do that, we're going to shrink, we're going to shrink this distance right here. Uh, and so what's, what's that going to force is that's going to force the triple point to start approaching X. Uh, um, uh, 
Yes, this is what I want to say. So this is the idea. Um, so, uh, well, I'll state what I claim and then you can see it, it's funny. So what we're going to do is in this, since this is uh, from x, y, so we're going to take some y prime in the interval in the geodesic from x to y, such that this triple point here, y prime z x, is equal to the distance from x to v, which we know is equal to the distance from uh, x to u. Right, so this as this Romov this product, as we move from y to x, this is going to go from uh, the length of x, y, and it's going to go to x. So at some point in between, it's going to give us this distance here. Or, or I guess, sorry, it's the distance from y to t, and then, uh, and then it's shrinking down to zero. So at some point by the intermediate value theorem, at some point we can choose it such that it satisfies this. And then what can we do? Then take any, any geodesic uh, from z to y prime and take the uh, subpath of x, y, uh, giving the geodesic. From x to y prime. So it's exactly this picture that I have here. So we take this y prime, and now we create this new triangle where we take the subpath here. The path from x to z, we leave the same. And then we just choose any new geodesic from y prime to z. But now we've done this in such a way such that we still have the distance from x to v as the distance from x to u. But now we have in addition that the length of this third leg is the same. So for this new triangle, what do we get? We get that the distance from uh, x to v is the same as x to u. And that's exactly going to be this distance. So these distances are the same. And that exactly means that in this new uh, in this new triangle, the, the new comparison triangle, we're going to get that it is the triple point. So in, so I gotta go on to the next page. So in this new geodesic triangle, um, we have that the new comparison map sends u and v to the triple point. All right, that's exactly how we chose y prime was to ensure that this happened. Uh, but now we have from case one, so case one, we have that uh, their distance is less than four delta. So we get therefore the distance from u to v is less than four delta by case one. Professor, can I ask a stupid question? Uh, sure. So the, how do we ensure that this y prime was a vertex in the graph? Uh, it need not be a vertex. So I, I, I mentioned this, I'm gluing edges uh, yeah. on the graph. Then I'm a little confused about this uh, geodesic from y prime to z because we defined the distance between vertices using paths, right? Uh, yes, but uh, so a path you can think of as, uh, so if we view the graph as a discrete space, then a path mm -hmm. is just a sequence of vertices. If we want to view the graph as a continuous space, when we glue in the edges, mm -hmm. then a path is just a uh, I isometric map from some interval to the graph. And so you can have paths even between uh, any, any point and any edge is also fine to define a path. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and in this, like when I use the 
the intermediate value theorem, of course, this requires that I glue thing. And even just defining the comparison uh, tripod, right, the Gromov product, the distance of the legs here will not necessarily be integers. They'll be integers divided by two. Uh, so that's something. Uh, okay. All right, but hopefully that's uh, clear enough. Uh, so therefore, a hyperbolic space just means all triangles are delta thin for some delta, or equivalently, all triangles are delta slim for some delta. So that's a hyperbolic uh, graph. Uh, okay, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the notion of a quasi-isometric embedding. So if we have two graphs, uh, and again, they're always connected. Always assume my graphs are connected, gamma and gamma prime. So then a map um, F from gamma to gamma prime is a quasi-isometric embedding if there exists some c greater than zero and r greater than zero such that uh, the distances in the gamma uh, metric are not so far off from the distances in their image in the gamma prime metric. So specifically, such that C inverse times the gamma distance from X to Y minus R is less than or equal to the uh, distance in the gamma prime graph of F of X, F of Y, and that this is less than or equal to C times the distance in the original graph plus R. So the idea of a quasi-isometric embedding is that if you look very, very far away so that you can't see these errors, R and C, uh, then it looks like you have uh, an embedding of one graph into the other. But you have to look very, very far away to see this. We'll also have the notion of a, a quasi-geodesic. So a sequence, uh, alpha, uh, n, uh, so this is either a finite or infinite sequence, uh, is a quasi-geodesic. So a geodesic was if it was a path and the distance between alpha n and alpha m was n minus m. So a quasi-geodesic, uh, so this doesn't need to be a path, it's just some sequence. So alpha n need not be connected to alpha n plus one, and we only want that it's geodesic up to bounded error. So is a quasi a sequence is a quasi geodesic if there exists c greater than zero and r greater than zero, such that uh, c inverse times the distance um, uh, between alpha m and alpha n minus r is less than or equal to m minus n, which is less than or equal to c times the distance between alpha n, alpha n plus r. All right, so that's a quasi-geodesic. And now the next proposition I want to prove is the following. Uh, that was first a remark. So, and that is that if we have a quasi isometric embedding, sorry, quasi isometric So then it takes geodesics uh, to quasi geodesics. And F takes geodesics 
from gamma to quasi omega six. All right, so this motivates the next proposition. Uh, so here's the proposition, and that is that if gamma uh, graph is hyperbolic, uh, and if we have C, uh, say, greater than or equal to 1, and I C should be greater than 1, so the inverse is maybe. C greater than or equal to one and R uh, greater than zero. Uh, so greater than or equal to zero. So then there exists some D greater than zero such that any CR quasi geodesic so this is a, I should say, CR quasi-geodesic uh, depend on C and R. Uh, so this is CR quasi-geodesic uh, for then for any CR quasi-geodesic alpha uh, and any and any geodesic beta having the same um, uh, start and finish or origin and terminal points origin and terminal points So then uh, we have that the Hausdorff distance between alpha and beta is less than D. So the Hausdorff distance, so i.e. the Hausdorff distance means that for all points, for all n, uh, for all points on one, there's some point on the other, which is distance at most D. So I e for all points on alpha, there exists uh, a point on beta uh, with distance on this D. At most D away and vice versa. Uh, so what this says, uh, yeah, so we have a hyperbolic graph. Uh, so then for any C and R, if we have a CR, there exists a D such that whenever we have a CR quasi-geodesic and whenever we have a genuine geodesic, the distance between them are not, uh, is not too large. It's fixed by this D, which only depends on CR and the delta wherever the hyperbolicity constant of delta is. What this means in particular is that uh, every quasi-geodesic is not so far away from a geodesic. Um, so that's as, as a corollary. In particular, this also means that uh, geodesic triangles, if we take a geodesic triangle, if we have a quasi-isometric embedding, and we take a geodesic triangle on gamma, then its image is not far away from a geodesic triangle in, um, in gamma prime, uh, meaning that it's up to some bounded error. So in particular, if gamma prime is hyperbolic, then we know that for even these quasi-geodesics that any two for these quasi geodesic triangles, the union of any two, the delta neighborhood of any two sides will be contained in the other for some larger delta. So, as a corollary of this proposition, so we won't prove this now, of course, uh, but the corollary of this, and this is why we're interested in this, the corollary is that if F 
maps gamma to gamma prime is a quasi-isometric embedding. And if gamma prime is hyperbolic, so then gamma is hyperbolic. So this is the corollary one. And then, uh, so I'll prove this uh, proposition on Friday, but let me give you an example, which is why we're interested in this. And that, is, so if gamma is now a finitely generated group uh, with generating set S, say S, same as S inverse, then we can consider the Cayley graph and the Cayley graph will be a connected graph. And so we can say that, uh, so gamma is hyperbolic if uh, the Cayley graph, Cayley graph, is hyperbolic. So that's a definition, I guess, not an example. Uh, so here's the definition. So a group is hyperbolic. Uh, uh, for a group with a give generating set is hyperbolic. Uh, but the observation is that if we change the generating set, then it's pretty easy to see that the identity map is a quasi-isometric embedding. So if S tilde, is another generating set. So then the identity map, mapping gamma with its distance coming from S to gamma with its distance coming from S tilde um, is a quasi-isometric embedding. Uh, and this is easy to see because you just write out uh, the elements in S as words in S prime or in S tilde and, and vice versa. And these will give you the constants from the quasi-isometric embedding. So this is a, a fun exercise for you to do. Um, as a consequence, it says that a group being hyperbolic does not depend on the generating set. Hence, Hence, by the previous or by this corollary uh, being hyperbolic, does not depend on the generating set. And then I'll give you one example, and that is gamma to be a free group on, say, n generators. Uh, well, in this case, with the natural, since we can choose any generating set, we'll just take the natural generating set, which is say A1 up to AN, uh, equal three generators. Well, then the Cayley graph here is a tree. So then the Cayley graph of, um, with respect to this S, of Fn is a tree. And trees uh, certainly satisfy the hypothesis that triangles are delta slim, say, because in that case, a triangle is a tripod already. So clearly, any one uh, side of the triangle is contained in the delta neighborhood. In fact, so trees are zero hyperbolic. So as a tree, is zero hyperbolic. So therefore, free groups are, you know, a very nice example of uh, hyperbolic groups. And, but there are many, many more hyperbolic groups than free groups. Uh, I'll maybe discuss some examples, but we probably won't prove very many because there's a whole industry about 
uh, creating strange hyperbolic groups uh, that I'm not really a part of. So anyway, I'll just leave that as an example, but there's many other interesting examples and, and we'll maybe discuss some of them. So I'll go ahead and prove this proposition here on Friday. Are there any questions? All right, great. In that case, I will see you guys on Friday.